Hello. So, Colditz Castle, a place to strike terror into the hearts of Allied officers throughout the war. Impregnable, foreboding, escape-proof. Yeah, right. Offlag 4C, or Colditz, gave us such a wealth of escape stories that it's led to a film, two TV series, and a board game. So why did the Rice most escape-proof prison spring so many leaks? Well, in answer to that, we're going to take a look at a series of factors that, when combined together, pretty much deliver the perfect storm for escape opportunities. The first of these is the building and its actual design. Collett's Castle is a formidable building. It's built on top of a 250-foot vertical cliff that has a sheer drop into the River Mulder below. Its outer walls are seven feet thick. But the trouble with castles is that being able to get out of a castle quickly and quietly is actually a design feature built into many of them. They're designed to keep people out. They're not really designed to keep people in. And maybe if the Nazis had read as many history books as they burned, they might have known that. Those seven feet walls are not solid, however, and once you're inside them, there is a myriad of hiding places and secret compartments that you can build or hack into them. And this feature leads us to the concept of ghosts, which to all intents and purposes were fake escapers. Prisoners would work their way into the walls and disappear, sometimes for months at a time, and the Germans would scour the surrounding area looking for an escaper that hadn't actually escaped. Then, once the fuss had died down, the plucky chap would return to the ranks, appearing in the morning roll call to replace somebody who then had escaped the previous night. And if that didn't make roll calls confusing enough, not everybody in the morning roll call was actually real. Here is a photograph of a collection of very smart Dutch officers. Can you spot the fake one? Well, he's here. If you check carefully below, you'll see that he doesn't have feet. He is, in fact, a portable dummy created for the express purposes of confusing the morning roll calls. Towards the end of the war, this combination with tactics was so efficiently done that roll calls are no guide whatsoever to the actual number of people in the castle at the time. And if we as historians ever get our hands on them, even we can't use them to gauge who was and wasn't in the castle at the time. Now, another consideration with the building is that also there is not room within the courtyard for the required space for exercise in line with the Geneva Convention. So the prisoners have to be taken out of the castle and down into a barbed wire enclosure in Colditz Towns Park. Taking this regular opportunity of only having a fence between him and freedom, French cavalry officer Pierre Marès Le Brun got a friend to give him a boost. He was launched over the fence at the back of the park and he hightailed it into the woods and freedom. The guards were that stunned with the opportunism that they pretty much watched him go. He also made a home run through Switzerland and back to French territory from this escape. Now, if the design flaws in the building weren't bad enough, the concept of bringing together every big time escapologist in the Allied forces and placing them in one place is gonna give you all manner of problems. These are people, bear in mind, that have demonstrated time and time again that they have the skills, the means, and the desire to get out of whatever you're going to put them in. This castle isn't going to intimidate your escapers. It might challenge them. It's probably even going to inspire them, but it's certainly not going to deter them. And since the Geneva Convention prevents officers from being given war work, these skilled and motivated people have a lot of time on their hands to create. The things you can do with time are almost infinite. One of the surprisingly common methods of getting out of Colditz Castle was to spend time and effort creating that oh-so-perfect disguise. As goes on in many camps, prisoners put on plays, they dress up and do theatre, and using the materials and time to make costumes as perfect as they can be, and then use them to just walk out of the front gate in disguise. 5th of June 1941, a lady walked out, a very elegant lady walked out of the castle gates. Not an uncommon occurrence. But on closer examination, the aforementioned lady turned out to be French Lieutenant Boulet, who had almost made it. Had he not dropped his watch and drawn attention to himself, he may well have got out of the third gate and off to freedom. Another French Lieutenant, Lieutenant Peridot, walked out of the gates disguised as Villy, the visiting camp electrician. 
He was a regular visitor. If you look at this photograph here, Lieutenant Peridot is the one on the left. Being such a regular visitor, Billy was rarely asked for papers, and it was only that Peridot's armband was slightly the wrong colour that rumbled him. Another serial escape artist within the castle, Michael Sinclair, managed to get through two of the three security checkpoints dressed as the very distinctive sergeant major of the camp guard. Um, it was the final guard on the third gate that insisted on papers, and it was papers that he couldn't replicate at the time. Again, disguise carries you a long way. And not to be left out, frequent British escaper and future Tory MP, Airy Neve, made himself a German uniform, which I think you'll agree doesn't look like a bad effort. The colour was slightly out, since the Germans are not in the habit of giving out fabric in their army colours. A worthy but unsuccessful effort. However, he would later go on to be the first British home run from Colbert. Now that's just what you can do as an individual. Two Frenchmen working together managed a tunnel that started in the most unlikely of places and again almost got out. The reason that they managed to get so far with the tunnel was the guards just couldn't find where the tunnel entrance was. They knew with absolute certainty that there was a tunnel attempt going on because of the noise of the mining operation that was going on under the floor of the chapel. The genius of the French tunnel, however, though, is that he started in the bell tower. Yes, the bell tower. The top floor of the bricked up bell tower, to be precise. And it came down through the floors and under the chapel. And in doing this, they had to saw through the oak floors of the tower using saws they'd made from table knives. I made a replica here. This one right here. Let's see a few more other kind of shots. And you basically make this by notching a table knife with a hacksaw, because a hacksaw isn't going to saw through an oak beam. This creates you a much, much stronger saw and you can duplicate so that you've got saws well in advance, well in excess of what you're provided with under terms of the Geneva Convention. This is just one that I quickly knocked up over a day and I say quickly knocked up, it did take me an entire day to do it. But if we uh, take a block of wood here and start even minor abrasions on the side there you can see that it starts to make some good distance into this block of wood using these and using a fair few of these because they wore them out those two frenchmen managed to saw through seven oak floors of the bell tower it took them a week per floor to get through it their brilliant idea worked on the simple premise of who the hell would look for the tunnel entrance on the seventh floor of the tallest building in the entire castle. Sadly for the French escapers, the gods did exactly that just two days before the tunnel was estimated to be completed. Couldn't really talk about what we we're going to do with time without referencing the Colbert Cock, the infamous glider escape. Uh, however, we're not going to be covering this today. We've got a whole separate video coming up covering the glider as a single project in its own right. So please do subscribe and click for notifications to be alerted to that coming out in a few weeks time. Now, aside from time, skills and desire, though, there is another factor that truly aids the Colbert's escaper that's just not present in other camps, and that is the jailer himself, uh, Captain Reinhold Eggers. He was by and large an honourable man who took the Geneva Convention of Treatment of Prisoners very seriously. He also understood very well that the people under his charge were going to try everything they could to escape, and he was going to try everything he could to minimise the successful ones. He never considered that escape prevention was possible, but he could make it as difficult and as minimal as he could, and as a result, the game was afoot. Because of his thinking, the punishment for escaping and being recaptured was a maximum of 30 days in solitary confinement. It's not pleasant, but it's not the harsh treatment that you can get in other prisoner of war camps, or worse still, concentration camps where such serial escapers as Jimmy James were placed in Sachsenhausen concentration camp. There's little risk to making the escape attempts, although the Stalag Luft three murders are an ever-present reminder that it's not totally risk-free. Eggers actually kept an escape museum in the castle of everything he confiscated from would-be escapers. He's responsible for a great many of the photographs that you've seen in the video today, and he even wrote a book called Colditz, the German Story. It's available from Pen and Sword. And it gives a unique account of camp life from the German side. I can't recommend this book enough. 
This combination of factors that we've discussed resulted in coal that's been far from escape proof, but in fact gave the most home runs out of the entire war. A home run being an escaper that manages to make it back to his home nation. And thanks to Eggert's publication and the meticulous record of every escape, it gives us the most escape stories in the war, which in turn lead to Colbert's being as infamous as it was. I suspect there are a great many other unpublicised escapes from other camps that just don't get the glory that Colbert gets. After the war, Colditz fell into East Germany and remained a prison for non-communists and later became used as a hospital and then a psychiatric clinic and then an old folks home. Yeah, you heard that correctly. A former prison being used as an old folks home. Today it's had a massive restoration where it's become a museum featuring many more tales of escapes than I could possibly tell you in one, two videos, even a series. If you're ever travelling to Saxony, then do be sure to visit. But there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for watching. I'm going to go work on my tunnel. See you next week. Bye bye.